Are you proud of the African Union? No, I'm not proud of the African Union. I think it is a body that is weak. It is a body that is manipulated. It is a body that doesn't do the right thing. And we have seen the many conflicts that are taking place in Africa, whether it's in Sudan or southern Cameroons or in Ethiopia. They are as silent as silence can be. That is a body that must be revamped. Can we make Prof the AU chairman? Prof, I, 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 are you interested in this role? Prof. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you again. <laughs> yes. But this again. time, not yes. in Nairobi. Yes. <laughs> in Malawi. In Malawi. This is my country number 30, but I just wanted to ask you, how many African countries have you been? It seems you've been everywhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done 50 now. Wow. Yeah, I've done 50, so... Why, why, why traveling in Africa in general? We've got to know Africa. When we say we are Africans, we've got to understand this continent and not understand her in the urban centers. You've got to travel to rural Malawi, rural Angola, rural Ghana. It gives you a feel of the country and you take the pulse and get to understand the people in their settings. And that is my joy. What is happening? I mean, if you don't know the reason why we are here, I mean, I am here because of Prof, even though my goal is to travel every African country, but I believe that I came here because of Prof, because I believe in what Prof is doing. You know, I think the first time I met you, I told you I'm not a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was so bold that day, yeah. and I told Prof, Prof, I'm not a big fan of you, yeah. because I really want to know that with all the speeches that you're giving across the continent, yes. what are you doing? Yes. But after this meeting yes. in Malawi, I'm your number one fan. Thank you. <laughs> no, tell them, tell them what you've done that they don't know in Malawi. What we are trying to do mm. across Africa with Malawi as the hub is to marry our words with our deeds. We have been in Malawi, we've met President Chakwera, senior government officials, and we have a delegation of over 50 people drawn from 13 different African countries and coming to Malawi and say, we want to invest in agriculture, we want to invest in education, we want to invest in IE technology, we want to invest in every sector, we want to green Malawi, and that is what we are going to do, not only in Malawi, but across the continent of Africa to demonstrate to the world and to ourselves that we can do it and we will do it. Do you agree with Kwame Nkrumah that a black man is capable of managing his own affairs? Oh, without doubt. The disruptions notwithstanding, I have no doubt in my mind that we are going to demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that we can feed ourselves, that we can run our affairs, and that those who have been doubting us will be shocked at the manner in which we do it, responsibly, with pride and humility at once. You are demonstrating to the fact that an African can be an investor in Africa. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, there's this idea which is misguided that an investor must be somebody who has come with bags of money from Europe, America and China. That is misguided. These are individuals who may come here, they may invest, but ultimately what is at the back of their mind is to benefit their countries. But when an African invests in Africa, he or she is doing it for the benefit of self, but for the benefit of Africa and Africans. And that, in my view, is sustainable. We must and we will stop begging because this is the mother continent. Tell me what is not here. Hmm. From human resource to natural resource, from arable land to adequate rain, the most even killed weather anywhere in God's created world. I, I believe that when God was creating the world, he spent the whole time in Africa making sure everything is in Africa. And then when he was tired, he was like, you know what, let me create Asia, let me create Europe. That's why, <laughs> that is why every continent want a piece of Africa. But to me, I believe that Africa got no friends. Do you agree with me? Oh, Africa has very few friends. Everybody has always come to this continent, whether they came as enslavers or colonizers. Africa has always been a hunting ground. Mm and they come to hunt, and when they hunt, they take their cash to their part of the world. So we must be our 
own friends. Africans are very hospitable. We welcome everybody, and in welcoming everybody, we are abused by them. So it is us who must now love ourselves and do things that are in our best interest and exercise the ghosts of low self-esteem, exercise the ghosts of doubt. And if we do that, let me tell you, Wodemaya, this world will never be the same again. Prof, I travel within Africa, mm. and I believe that there is a problem with leadership in Africa, of which sometimes I don't want to get involved because I'm still like learning. I've, I believe you've been to 50 countries in Africa, and you will agree with me that leadership in Africa got problems. I don't know if you agree with me. Oh, I can't agree more with you. In my younger life, until now, I'm a martial artist. And one of the greatest martial artists and philosophers is Bruce Lee, with his art called Jide Kunedu. And he says that a leader must be agile, like a martial artist. Agile, like water. If it is in a glass, it takes the shape of, what, of the glass. If it is in a bottle, it takes the shape of a bottle, but it doesn't change. It can be solid, it can be gas, it can be liquid, but it's still water. Leadership. A leader must have vision. You've got to see the big picture. Do we have such leaders? Whether it's in the political arena, you are typical African so-called leader. I don't use leader when I'm talking about African politician, because it's an insult to the world. The problem of Africa, simply stated, is one of leadership at the political level. Remember, post-colonization, we inherited systems of governance which are alien to us. And the men and women whom we put into office or rig themselves into political office are individuals who, on a scale of one to ten, only three are interested in the continent of Africa or in their countries in a manner that is beneficial to the people. That is why we have no shortage of thieves in public office. We have no shortage of murderers in public office. We have no shortage of nepotists. We have no shortage of tribalists in public office. And that is the single thing that we must sort out. The day we sort out the problem of leadership in Africa, that is the day Africa will realize our potential. And, and, and it must be done. And it must be done quickly. And we must speak about and against it. Because if we don't, then these individuals, these demigods, will always try to destroy the continent for this generation and generations yet to be born. You said they rigged their way to office. Most of the time. So which means it's so real. Oh, yeah. I mean, these fellows rig themselves into office, most of them. And they manipulate the ballot box. And when they manipulate the ballot box, then they create resentment. And when they create resentment, then they themselves become afraid of the population which they claim elected them into public office. <laughs> and that is tragic. Prof, you said African leaders are demigods. Yes. Why do you say you so? Know, they, they are demigods because most of them want to be worshipped rather than to serve. And let me say that there are quite a number of African leaders who are good. Mm. There are people in Africa and uh, they are there and they have been there who have had the continent at heart. Oh, but cool. the tragedy is that they are few and far between. When, when we talk about leadership, we are talking about politicians. Yeah. We are talking about el so-called elected politicians mm. in many countries. These are individuals who go to office on the promise that they are going to deliver. And as I've said before, and I repeat it again, one of the shortest avenues to acquisition of material wealth is the political arena in Africa. And that is why we see our agriculture is not doing well, our education is not doing well, our health sectors are not doing well. But in the few countries where leadership is committed, mm. you can see that things are happening in a proper manner. And there are quite a number of countries in this regard. You go to uh, Tanzania, you see some good work is being done, there, being done there. In Rwanda, some good work is being done there. 
in Botswana, some good work is being done there. And, but they are few and far between. We want an Africa that works, an Africa that functions, an Africa where people go into office because they want to serve, not to be served. That Africa is the Africa that we are now running around the continent and telling leadership and urging leadership to create with our help. Do you believe that there is elections in Africa, something we call free and fair elections in Africa? Uh, there are very few. The <laughs> thing called free and fair elections is a fiction in many African countries. It is a fiction because elections are manipulated either through ethnicity or through bribery. And the people's will is manipulated in that way. And that is why you are beginning to see hmm. a groundswell of resentment, popularly elected leaders being removed from office through coup d'etats. The coup d'etat is the language of the unheard. Not that one wants unconstitutional changes of power, but when those in power claim to have been elected and they are not elected and they use public office to serve themselves and to serve past colonizers, then coup d'etats and unconstitutional changes of power become inevitable. Prof, currently there's a lot of coup d'etats happening in the western of Africa. And do you think that is the way forward? It is not the way forward, but it is inevitable. And you can see that happening for, particularly in the former French colonies. One of the worst colonizers in the history of the world are the French. And even when they pretended to leave, they still remained and are manipulating the economies of this country. And we have seen coup d'etats in Burkina Faso, in Guinea, in Mali, and now in Niger. And young men in the military are saying, because the civilian population is helpless, we are coming in to intervene for the purposes of cleaning up this mess. Do I support it? Yes because it is inevitable, because that is the only way. Do I support their continued remaining in power? No, they are simply midwifing a process and creating an environment where changes will begin to take place in a proper manner so that we begin to have proper elections and begin to inject some civility and hygiene in mm. the conduct of our affairs. But sometimes I feel like they come in that we want to help the people. As soon as they taste power, yes. they'll be like, you know what? I want to be there yeah, forever. That, that is a danger. That is why civic awareness is very critical. Remember that when you taste a little power and you are not humble, then you become drunk with it. So it is the duty of the population to be vigilant. And vigilance is what will tell the coup makers that if you joke, this time round we are not going to sit there, we are going to come out in the millions and your guns will become hopeless and useless in the face of mass rebellion. Are you proud of the African Union? No, I'm not proud of the African Union. I think it is a body that is weak. It is a body that is manipulated. It is a body that doesn't do the right thing. And we have seen the many conflicts that are taking place in Africa, whether it's in Sudan or southern Cameroons or in Ethiopia. They are as silent as silence can be. That is a body that must be revamped is a body that must have men and women who are crusaders, men and women who are not cowards, men and women who are prepared to sacrifice for the continent, is a body that is crying for change. Currently, ECOWAS came and they said they want to, I mean, go for war in, <laughs> in Niger. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Niger actually needed support. Absolutely. Not war. But you know that the, the decisions that were being made by ECOWAS, and I'm very happy with the Nigerian Senate telling their president straight on, we are not going to allow you to send our men and women to fight their brothers. But you could see uh, the subterranean manipulation of France and the United States of America. And the people came and said, we don't want war. People in Nigeria told their president, we do not want war. Our Nigerian brothers need support. But it tells you how African bodies are susceptible to manipulation by foreign powers mm. who want to have their dirty work done by our own, asking brother to rise and fight against brother, sister to rise and fight against sister. We must always remember that there are fifth columnists 
in our ranks and it is our duty to identify them so that they do not become Trojan horses to destroy us. Based on popular demand, we want to make you the new AU chairman. <laughs> 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 Prof, I, I'm not joking, you know. The, the youth of Africa, you see, like you have so much influence on the continent. Yeah. Like, I posted a picture with you. Yeah. And everybody is like, uh, I think uh, you have made it in life. Just by, <laughs> just by taking a photo yeah. with Prof. And somebody commented that, can we make Prof the AU chairman? Prof, I, 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 are you interested in this role? You know, my own view is Africa needs sons and daughters who will serve her. Hmm. If Africa summons us to serve, we will serve Africa. Bring the current. <laughs> we, we, we're looking for people who are ready to serve Africa. And I believe Prof can serve Africa. Prof, I want to be your main campaign manager, yeah. getting into the AU house. Yes. I, I, is, are you okay with it? <laughs> ah, okay. I just got a new job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I just got a new job. So, Prof, I mean, it um, starts today. Yeah. The video gets uploaded, and you all need to. What do we need to do? How, how do you get people into um, <laughs> AU? We'll find out. No, I need to do research about that. We're going to make it happen. And I believe that each and everyone watching me right now, I mean, agrees with me. Let me know in the comment section. Should we make Prof the new AU chairman? I mean, the number one fan in here. Who else? Let me know in the comment section. I, I'm just going to put all the links that will make it possible in the description. Thank prof, you. we are getting you to AU. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting you to AU. I mean, Prof does not have enough time. But my, my, my last question, if you have a message for Africa as well, what would that message be? Africa must be great. And she will only be great if her sons and daughters make the decision to make her great. And we must make her great in governance, in agriculture, in health, in education, and we must eliminate the many boundaries, eliminate the visas, create one currency. Africa must unite. Prof, it's so expensive to travel within Africa. Terrible. Why, why is it so? Because uh, we don't travel. If you don't travel, uh, then the businessmen want to make money. So one of the things that we must do, we must have Africans traveling within Africa. But even though we love to travel, yeah. but there are so many visa restrictions. That is what we must eliminate. No more visas. I want to travel from Dhaka in Senegal as if I was traveling within Dhaka, Dhaka to Nairobi, no visas. Thank you so much, God Prof. Bless you. Prof has a meeting. <laughs> I would have loved to continue this. But don't worry, we're going to continue this interview in another country. He has a meeting to attend. I, I, I'm so sorry. Um, thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe and be part of this awesome channel. But popular request, let's make Prof the new AU chairman because I believe that Africa deserves him.